Cataphract by GMT Games. This is a war game depicting several battles of the ancient Roman Empire. Well, the late Roman Empire, so late that it was over pretty much already. Uh, and in fact, uh, we are in the 6th century when the Emperor Dace Justinian uh, had the smart idea, um, romantic idea, of uh, unifying the Empire again, uh, absorbing the, uh, the Empire of the West against the various populations that were controlling at the time, uh, which did not really work. But the game shows you some of the battles that were fought by Belisarius, Justinian's commander. Uh, actually, this is a pretty rich package because it has land battles set in that in that historical context. There is a a naval battle too, and there is a campaign game, no like mini game meant to connect uh, uh, land battles or small events. A bona fide, uh, full size uh, strategic game that depicts at the strategic level uh, the wars uh, of, of Justinian. It is called Justinian, and not by not by not by chance. And in that game, it's a two player game in which you have one player representing Justinian and the Byzantines, and a player representing all the other populations around the Mediterranean area and in the east that are pressing against uh, the borders of the empire or simply trying to resist the pressure that Justinian is putting towards the West. So, uh, very, very uh, rich package with a lot of stuff here. The land battles uh, um, I played, I played using the simple Great Battles of History. This is the eighth volume in the Great Battles of History. And it is one of the volumes that is compatible with the simple Great Battles of History system, which is a simpler, uh, leaner, more streamlined version of the full rules. So I use those rules to play this one. And if you're unfamiliar with the rules of the simple Great Battles of History system, I made a video for that, so I'm not going to cover the basics of the system again. What I'm going to do is to tell a little bit about the land battles that I played. I did not play the naval battle here because that can be played only with the full set of rules, which I'm not familiar with yet. But I played the land battles and I played the game. So this is going to be a pretty long review because I'm reviewing a lot of stuff and pretty much two different games or a system with several battles and a full scale strategic game. So, without further ado, let's start talking about the stuff and the many game options that you find in Cataphract. This is the map of the game, as it may look like at setup. I set up the game, but there are several ways in which the game can be set up depending on how the players decide to distribute their forces on the board. In any case, generally speaking, uh, the Byzantine player will control this area here, this area with this part of the Middle East and Egypt. And the Mizzetine player will place troops, frontier troops and armies to defend his territory. There are armies that have to stay around Constantinople, around the Emperor, and then the armies that are placed to defend the borders of the Empire. The non-Byzantine player, also called the Barbarian player in the game, controls, uh, I wouldn't say a coalition, but uh, a smorgasbord of different populations that are there to annoy the heck out of the Byzantines. And these populations include three main groups, the Persians that come from that area, the Ostrogoths that control Italy at the beginning of the game, the Vandals that control this area of Africa and southern Spain, and then a large group of smaller populations that are represented by boxes that are all around the borders of the of the of the map. And both the Byzantine player and the Barbarian player will get to place strength points on the map at the beginning of the game. These strength points representing location and concentration of forces that the players choose to deploy at the beginning of the game. There are several types of units in the game. There are fleets. Fleet units can move by themselves and start naval battles and or they can transport land troops. Land units, we have Byzantine frontier units. They have a number printed on their counter indicating the size of the unit. The higher the number, the more strength points the unit has, the stronger it is. And you can add points to that to enforce your, 
to enforce your frontier units, but Byzantine frontier units do not move, they do not retreat, they're just meant to defend the borders. Byzantine army markers, they do not have any numerical value printed on them, they simply have a name, and then there are corresponding markers for each army that are placed on that track, and they keep track of the changing size of the armies. You add strength points to an army, then you record that by moving markers on that track. The army loses points, strength points, or drops off strength points to form frontier units, then again you record that on that track. And uh, army units belonging to the barbarian player are uh, formed by using the markers that in the tactical game uh, are used to indicate cohesion hits on the units. Then we have leaders. So leaders have three ratings printed on them, and these are control, very important for a variety of, uh, of checks uh, that are meant to represent how well the leader can control his troops. For example, after a battle, uh, even if you're the winner, you still have to take a check to see if your army gets disorganized or not. You roll a d10, if you roll higher than your the control uh, value of your leader, then your army is disorganized. Then we have another reading, which is a letter reading for movement. Movement allowance changes for, from leader to leader and from turn to turn. When you activate a certain leader to lead an army for movement, you roll a die and you cross-reference on a table the, the, the quality of the movement rating, which are A, B, C, or D, you cross-reference that with the result and you get the number of movement points. Uh, well, Here's the table, just to show you how it works. I activate a C leader, roll a die, say I rolled a 3, that leader for this activation has 4 movement points. And then we have a third value, which is the battle value, which may be used to modify battle results. At the beginning of each turn, starting from the second, uh, the Byzantine player has an income phase in which he manages the treasury of his empire. Only the Byzantine player has to deal with money and spends money to do things. So at the beginning of each turn during the income phase, the Byzantine player receives a gold, this is the unit, uh, the currency in the game, one gold for each province, unless the province has a number indicating another another value, in that case that is the value that the province generates. The Byzantine player records the amount of money that he earned in that turn, on that track, by moving those markers, but then alas, money needs to be spent to maintain troops. Yes, you need to pay your troops. Frontier units are not as good as armies, but they are much cheaper to maintain. Armies are much more expensive, and you have to pay these huge amounts of money to maintain your armies. You do not have all that money, or you do not want to spend it. That's fine, that's your choice. Uh, problem is, if you do not pay to maintain your armies, then you have to place a, a non-paid marker on each uh, army or frontier units that you have not compensated. Uh, and this may have negative effects in the game, especially if a random event um, generates, a random event that may happen during the game generates a revolt. After the income phase, the players alternate to performing impulses, activation impulses. Uh, the Barbarian player goes first, but I'll tell about the Byzantine player first because it's a little simpler, a little more linear. When the Byzantine player activates, he can choose to activate one of his armies, in which case, however, he has to pay 2G to do so. Yes, and the armies do not activate for free. Or the Byzantine player can choose to activate a leader and move that leader only without the army. That doesn't cost anything. Or the player, the Byzantine player can choose to raise more troops, which actually doesn't cost anything. The player simply rolls a die and adds that number of strength points to forces on the board. Of course, the player can also choose to pass. And after that, the impulse is done. Then you move the marker to indicate the impulse was done and the next impulse needs to be resolved. Up to five impulses can be performed by each player each turn. Uh, how about the non-Byzantine player? Well, the 
Barbarian player has two select activations and three random activations. That is, he can play these markers when it is time for him to activate units and he places there to record both how many impulses have been played and the type of impulse that has been chosen for each activation. Select activation markers. Uh, when playing that marker, the Barbarian player can choose to activate the Persians or the Ostrogoths or the Vandals. Those are the only three populations that can be selected. You select that and you simply then uh, can move an army to, uh, to move and or to attack. Uh, how about the random activations? Well, this is when it gets tricky. When the uh, Barbarian player selects a random activation, the Barbarian player needs to roll two dice and the results, uh, you need to know the results. For example, I rolled a 2 and a 1. These two die rolls are used for two things. One, they're used for random events. You total the two numbers and if it's 10 or more, a random event happens, in which case you roll again on the random events table and you see what random event the dice generated. Those same two numbers, in this case, for example, I rolled a 2 and a 1, after you check for random events, those two numbers are read as a two-digit number. 2 and 1 is 21. Then you look at the Barbarian activation table and you see what those two numbers activated. For example, with a 2 and a 1, I get to activate the Ostrogoths, which also are one of the populations you can activate by selection, and it may also happen that you will activate them during the random activation, but may, they may not be the case. You may end up activating the Visigoths, or the Slavs, or the Crimean Goths. There are just many population that, populations that can be activated. Now, tricky thing, whenever a tribe, say the Franks, is activated for the first time during the turn, you need to check for allegiance. Even though it was the barbarian player to activate the population, it is not uh, written in stone that the population will fight for him. So you need to roll a die and to check on the barbarian allegiance table to see if the population is neutral, in that case nothing happens, or it fights for the Barbarian player, that means that the Barbarian player will control that population, or if the population goes the other way, that is, if it helps the if it helps the Byzantine player, in which case the Byzantine player can simply add the strength points from that uh, from that tribe to his own troops, or he can control that troop and do what the troop would usually do, that unit would usually do, that is movement and or uh, attacking. So uh, it can be pretty tricky. Trickery can be even more prominent if the Byzantine player decides to use bribery. The Byzantine player can choose to spend money to influence the die roll on the Barbarian Allegiance table, but uh, there are just so many things that the Byzantine player needs to spend money for um, that he will never be able to do everything. When you activate a group of units, you determine the movement allowance of that group of units, and then, well, you spend movement points to move, yes, of course, but not only for that. Movement points have many uses in this game. To move from one area to uh, the next one, it costs a single movement point. The terrain has no effect on movement, with the exception of straights. They do cost a little more to move through. Uh, but then you spend movement points to do stuff. Uh, for example, um, you need to spend movement points to attack an enemy. You may get in an area where there is an enemy army and you're not forced to attack. The other, the other player can choose to intercept. Yes, the non-active player can try to intercept the moving enemy armies. In that case, uh, you need to, to, to check if you're able to do so. And if you manage to do so, then you resolve a fight in which you are the attacker, which has its own advantages. If you are moving into an enemy area and you want to attack, you need to spend a movement point. A movement point is spent to organize an army that is disorganized to combine different armies in a single stack for the um, for the barbarian player movement points are needed to place control markers and for the byzantine player they are needed to remove control markers 
all areas that do not have control markers on the game belong to the Byzantine player, the ones with control markers belong to the Barbarian player. So when you move and you decide to attack, well then you resolve combat. Resolving combat is really quite straightforward. Both players roll a die, they modify the die roll based on many possible modifiers and there are different sets of modifiers for the attacker and for the defender, which is why deciding who is the attacker and who is the defender can be important. You cross-reference the modified die roll with the strength of, the, of your army, so both players roll independently and both players check their column and their result and the number that the players find and the intersection between the strength of the army and modified die roll is the number of strength points of damage that are inflicted on the opponent. Um, just to have a look at the modifiers, a very important one is, is the strength differential. The size that has more points in strength gets a bonus and that uh, is higher the bigger is the difference. For example, having an army is twice that of the opponent or three times that of the opponent or four times that of the opponent. That grants increasingly um, beneficial bonuses. Also, there are things that factor in different ways in which the armies fight. For example, the Byzantine armies, so when they're attacking, they get a bonus of plus one against non-Persian defenders. And this is because of the superiors of cavalry. If the attacker, attacker is the Ostrogoth army, then there is a minus one for the attacker because of the poor use of bows. So, uh, things like that. After the two sides inflict said uh, damage on the opponent, after you calculate the number of strength points that are lost by each army, the army that lost the most strength points is the defeated army, and that army or that group of troops receives the defeat marker, and, and that also uh, summarizes the negative effects. It costs an extra movement point for a defeated army to move, the defeated army cannot attack, but if attacked in combat has a penalty of minus two. The winner army still has to take a check and if a control check is failed, the winning army receives a disorganized marker which forces the army to spend extra movement points on movement, one extra movement point per province, and the army can attack but has a modifier of minus one during combat. This is the map and the setup for the Battle of Dara. Uh, not many terrain features as you can see, a little bit of a hill there, but one terrain feature which is very important is that trench right there, which is the key element in Belisarius' strategy of defense. Belisarius is there, um, ready with his troops to defend against a very large number of Persian units. Pretty scary number indeed. At least uh, there aren't many Persian leaders, so this army may get a little, a little uh, problematic to, to lead, to lead effectively. But still, um, even though Belisarius has a superiority in terms of leaders, five leaders there, uh, six actually, there are just so many more Persian units. What is Belisarius trying to do? Well, this, the, the setup here reproduces the historical situation, which also mirrors Belisarius' plan, which was to use the trench not so much to stop the Persians, but to channel them and to force them to split. And as they moved in two wings, uh, Belisarius, uh, Belisarius' missile units were ready to shower the enemies with arrows. There are very few uh, Persian units that have range attacks, as opposed to units in Belisarius' army that, well, have, have many more. So denying the center, splitting the forces of the opponents, uh, using range attacks, and then try to finish them off as they get close. That was the original plan which, strictly speaking, worked pretty well for Belisarius. I'm going to play the battle next and I'm going to see if history is going to repeat itself, if the plan is going to work or if the Persians are going to be able to do better this time. Battle of Tagine. Here we have the setup with the Byzantine units right there and a group of Goth units there. 
Uh, the situation, well, we are during the Byzantine reconquest of Italy. They had conquered Italy first, uh, they had lost it to the Goths, and now they're trying to take it back under the command of Narses. And the Goths are under the command of Totila. Um, not many special rules in this scenario. Uh, the scenario starts with a champion challenge between two champions of the two sides, and you roll a die to determine who the winner is. The winner, the side that wins, uh, will go first and also will have a bonus when, when taking checks for the first six turns, uh, when checking for uh, troop quality. Um, I, that, that, actually, this is something that also applies to the previous scenario, I, I think I forgot to mention it. Um, other things, uh, the Goths are really ferocious, uh, they have ferocity, is a status that they have at the beginning of the game. It allows them to uh, enter an enemy zone of control and to shock attack even if they are not in command, which usually they shouldn't be able to do. And also it allows them to get a bonus when they are shock, uh, when they are shock attacking. However, they may lose the status of ferocity when the units start to rout. Each time that a goth unit routes, you need to roll die, compare the result with the commander's uh, initiative, and depending on the result, you may uh, lose that status, and from that moment on, the, the goths, well, they lose ferocity and they don't get that advantage anymore. There are other limitations about whom they can attack and when they can attack uh, to mirror the inertia that uh, the goth initiative the goth infantry showed uh, historically uh, somehow they didn't participate to the battle they didn't do much it's unclear why but what is clear is that the rule the game has rules to mirror that and to reduce the effectiveness of the of the gothic infantry units terrain Pretty clear, yes, we have a river and some elevations there, an elevation here. But other than that, I believe that most of the action will happen in clear terrain, so terrain will probably not be um, a major factor in the resolution of the battle. Battle which I'm going to play next. I really want to see how this one goes. The Byzantines have just reconquered Italy and there you go, another enemy arises, more problems and this time the problems come from the Franks that invade Italy. And here we have the Battle of Casilino when the Byzantines try to stop the advance of the Franks. The Byzantines are lined up here ready to defend, they have as usual a considerable high number of units that have range attacks and this I think is going to be very key in this scenario considering that the Franks here specialize in melee combat and they have some pretty serious, pretty dangerous, pretty scary uh, melee, um, melee tactics ready. There is a special rule here that handles the Frank Wedge which is the formation, the triangular formation that you see here. When the point of the wedge comes in contact with an enemy unit, uh, the attack is resolved as normal, but then the second line of the wedge can advance. The units in that line can advance uh, without uh, changing, facing. They can spend the movement allowance to approach enemy units. They move until they uh, get close to an enemy unit, get, a, get adjacent to an enemy unit, and then there's all the attack. And then the next line can do the same, and so on and so forth. So the Frank Wedge can pack quite uh, an impact, quite a punch, which makes them well, pretty scary. To that you can add the fact that in this scenario too, like in the previous scenario, um, the side here, the non byzantine sign, has ferocity at the beginning of the scenario, which means that they can move adjacent to enemy units even when they're not in command. Uh, it seems to me that the battle is going to be a little scripted because I really can't see any way for the Byzantines to defend against the power of the wedge if not by working along historical lines, if not by doing pretty much exactly what was done in history. And the Byzantines did win this battle by doing what? Well, first by disrupting the wedge uh, under a rain of arrows and missiles and then by attacking the flanks. It seems to me that this is really going to be the, the best, if not the only way for the Byzantines to, to handle the battle. So, um, I'm interested in this battle, I want to see how it goes, I'm happy to learn about a battle that I did not know before. 
uh, as of now, just looking at the map and the setup and looking at the rules of the scenario, uh, this one seems a little less exciting to me than the other ones that they played so far. But hey, maybe I'll be wrong, and actually, of course, I hope I'll be wrong because I want to have fun when I play my games. Setup for the Battle of Tree Cameron, and again, we have a map that doesn't have many terrain features, but there is a river here that clearly will be a factor, but not particularly complex terrain otherwise. Tree Cameron, this time we are in Africa as part of Belisarius' attempt to reconquer uh, the, east, the western part of the empire. Here we have the Vandals fighting against the Byzantines again. Like in other scenarios in this set, the um, non-Byzantine player starts with ferocity, with the ability of entering enemies also control, even when not in, in command. And another thing is that this time there are uh, factors that are, will bring some uncertainty to the Byzantine forces. There there is a Han unit which is completely unreliable and recalcitrant. They will try not to fight and actually depending on how the battle goes there's even a chance that they will switch sides. Uh, the point is that this is mirroring how historically that unit was just going to go with whoever was going to win the battle no matter which side that was. Also the Byzantines start as heavily outnumbered but they are waiting for reinforcements and may or may not enter the game. At the beginning of each game turn the Byzantine player rolls a die and on a roll of zero the reinforcements which are quite a good number of reinforcements will enter the battle. Uh, that can be a game changer that by itself. I guess that this would give uh, more replay value to the battle as you can play what if scenarios so for example one without that support at all and one with that uh, uh, with the infantry, with the enforce, infantry reinforcing the battle early on, you can see how that goes. As of, well, what it looks like right now, the Byzantines are heavily outnumbered, they again can count on superiority in, uh, in range weapons, and that means that again that is going to be a factor that they have to rely on and they have to exploit as best as they can if they want to have a chance to win the scenario. I played Cataphract, uh, the land battles, mainly as an introduction to the simple Great Battles of History system, which is a system that I heard a lot about, I wanted to, uh, to play. And I think I had a good intuition in starting from this game. Because the battles in here are all pretty small in size, so for a beginner in the system that is something that makes the battles more manageable. Um, the system has uh, many rules that pertain to special units, which are not represented here. Uh, also the system has some large units, two hex units, which have special movements to represent the, the clanky way in which these units move, special rules to handle aspect specific things of their, of their behavior in the game, and you do not, have, do not have those here, all the units here are single hex uh, units. So it seems to me uh, that this it seems to me that this is a good game to start to play in the system. If you consider uh, starting playing the system, well, consider this game. The land battles here are definitely very manageable. Uh, they may not be very balanced. You can pretty much see which side is going to be doomed uh, at the beginning. The design notes even tell you that already. They give you that spoiler there. But of course, there are ways of balancing things out. And in particular, since these battles are not too big, if you really want to play them in competitive ways, then you play each battle twice. You switch side with your opponent, and you can see who each side that does better is the winner or uh, is destroyed uh, um, less horribly as the loser. You, 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 you keep, you retain a competitive aspect in that fashion. On the other hand, um, if I want a perfectly balanced game, I can play chess. I do not mind situations which are doomed for one of the sites in war games, as long as that gives me historical flavor and this game has historical flavor. Uh, tons of it. That's, there's no lack of that. So I enjoyed playing the, the land battle. So they felt some of them a little bit scripted. It didn't feel like the players, the two sides would have a million options unless they decided to play silly for the sake of it. Yet nevertheless, the battles are tight, they're self-contained. They create the narratives which I found convincing and interesting. Sometimes it was interesting to see uh, how the doomed side would simply 
meet its doom. Um, the stories uh, within each battle, uh, the situation that the battles create, uh, all these things were interesting enough to keep me want to play them, even if the conclusions seem to be fairly obvious. The game, the, the Justinian game, that's that's a whole lot of game, and actually I've been debating whether or not to make a separate review for it, and then I said, whatever, I'm gonna make a long review instead. Justinian, um, in a nutshell, to me, that's a fairly good and enjoyable solitary study of, of the situation of the time, which is very complex when you have an empire that is dealing with so many political and economic and military factors from all directions. Um, so it works very well as a solitaire game, which is the only way in which I played it. So I played both sides at the best of my possibilities, identifying emotionally with the Byzantine side, um, which is, let's face it, the one that has more flavor, more personality in the game. You have more challenges, more factors that you need to take into account, the economic factor that's a huge element that you have to figure out how to deal with, and also you have more choices, more options. Um, more challenges, more ways to go about things and to prioritize. As the Barbarian player, you're just trying to prevent the, the Byzantine player from winning the game. Victory conditions are, uh, well, the Byzantine player needs to control territories and the non-Byzantine player needs to prevent the opponent from doing so. So, as the Barbarian player just trying to punch holes in the borders of the opponent to uh, look for soft spots and you hit those, when you can do that, when you can figure out how to activate the units that could do that, there's just so much randomness on the barbarian side that I can't see that being too enjoyable to play in a two-player game as you're playing that side. Maybe it is, um, that's just my assumption, if you play the game you love that side, that's fine, uh, please share your experience here so we can have that angle too. Um, I just didn't feel the desire to play the game with somebody else, to give that side to play to somebody else or to have to play it myself. That side to me almost is already an AI. There's so much chaos, uh, so much randomness, and most of the decisions for that side seem to be pretty straightforward. Uh, it works well if you think of it as an AI and you, the Solitaire player, are the, uh, the Byzantine player, you are Justinian. So, in conclusion, this is a package that I enjoy playing. I haven't played a naval battle, so there's more stuff that you can do. But that would take good value for my money. Uh, and I spent quite a bit of it, because this game is out of print, so I had to track down a comp in the collector's market. Didn't come all that cheap. Uh, there are cheaper options. I, see, I saw that uh, GMT has this uh, game in P500, so if you're interested in this game, you heard about it, maybe after watching this review you're curious about it, you can go on the GMT site, and maybe you, you reserve a copy, you P500 it, and maybe one day they'll reprint it, otherwise there are still copies around if you're willing to spend a little bit in this game. If you do spend a little bit, I think it's still good money because you have a full strategic game which works very well as a Soiter game, not so sure as a two player game, but as a Soiter game, it, it's, it's a fine game. You have all of these battles which are uh, perfectly worth in their own, uh, on their own merits and that are perfectly fun to play and they can be good introductions to the system. They were good introductions to the system to me. So again, great package, not hard to find, a little expensive, but if Junity ever reprints it, well, there is another option for you there. I think this is a game that deserves to be reprinted. This is a game that probably deserves more love and more circulation because there's a lot of interesting stuff in here. The period is interesting, is one that is not covered in many war games, so I'm happy that the game was printed uh, to start with, that the game is still available. I'm happy that I got to play it, and I hope that more people will give this game a chance in the future.